Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. For those of you new, hi, my name is Matt and I'm a junior doctor currently working in the UK's National Health Service. And today, I want to tell you how a pulse oximeter works. Pulse oximetry has been something that's been used within general practices and hospitals for quite a long time now. But since the coronavirus pandemic, people have been using it more and more in their own home to track their own oxygen saturation. Your oxygen saturation is just effectively how much oxygen there is in your blood. So in order to understand how pulse oximetry works, we first need to understand how oxygen is carried around the body. When we breathe in air, the oxygen diffuses across specialized membranes in our lungs and into our bloodstream. But the oxygen doesn't then just float around in our blood. It binds to specialized molecules called hemoglobin, which carries it around the body. When hemoglobin has oxygen bound to it, it's called oxyhemoglobin. And when there is no oxygen bound, it's called deoxyhemoglobin. Pulse oximetry is based on the principle that oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin absorb red and near-infrared light to different extents. Oxyhemoglobin absorbs greater amounts of infrared light and lower amounts of red light than hemoglobin. This scientific principle can be seen in practice, with arterial well-oxygenated blood appearing bright red due to the fact that it scatters more red light than deoxyhemoglobin. And similarly, deoxygenated venous blood appears much darker because it absorbs more red light. It's a fortunate scientific coincidence that hemoglobin has these properties, because red and near-infrared light penetrates the skin and soft tissue much better than other forms of electromagnetic radiation of around the same wavelength. Pulse oximeters exploit this difference in absorption profiles to detect the level of oxygenation within the blood. Pulse oximeters emit two wavelengths of light, red light at 660 nanometers and near-infrared at 940 nanometers from a pair of small light-emitting diodes located in one arm of the finger probe. The light that is transmitted through the finger is then detected by a photodiode on the opposite arm of the probe. From this, the probe can calculate the relative amount of red and infrared light absorbed, and this can be used to ultimately determine the proportion of hemoglobin bound to oxygen. But this does present a problem. When we measure oxygen saturation of blood, we want the measure of oxygen saturation of arterial blood, not venous. This is because the arterial blood is still oxygenated, having not delivered the oxygen to the tissues yet, whereas the venous blood has already delivered oxygen to the tissues and is mostly deoxygenated. Because of this, only arterial blood can supply us with a reliable reading of how well we are oxygenating our blood. The ability of pulse oximetry to detect oxygen saturation of only arterial blood is based on the principle that the amount of red and infrared light absorbed fluctuates with the cardiac cycle. This is because the arterial blood volume increases when the heart contracts, because the heart is pumping oxygenated blood to the peripheries, and similarly decreases when the heart relaxes, whereas the blood volume of veins and capillaries remain fairly constant throughout the cardiac cycle. A portion of the light that passes through tissues without being absorbed strikes the probe's photodetector and, accordingly, creates signals with a relatively stable and non-pulsatile direct current component, as you can see here, as well as a pulsatile alternating current component. The former is due to blood flow through the veins and capillaries, which have a fairly constant volume throughout the cardiac cycle, and the latter is due to the pulsatile nature of the arteries. Pulse oximeters use the amplitude of the absorbances to calculate the red-infrared modulation ratio, where A equals absorbance. In other words, R is a double ratio of the pulsatile and non-pulsatile components of red light absorption to infrared light absorption. At low oxygen saturations, where there is increased deoxyhemoglobin, the relative change in the amplitude of the red light absorbance due to the pulse is greater than the infrared absorbance, due to the fact there is less oxyhemoglobin to absorb the infrared signal. This results in a higher R value. Conversely, at higher oxygen saturations, more infrared light is absorbed, and so the R value is lower. A microprocessor in pulse oximeters uses this ratio, calculated over a series of pulses, to determine the oxygen saturation based on a calibration curve that was generated empirically by measuring R in healthy volunteers whose saturations were altered from 100 to approximately 70%. Because of this, saturation readings below 70% should not be considered quantitatively reliable. However, if your patient does have saturations of anywhere near 70%, the last thing you need to be doing is having a scientific debate on the accuracy of your equipment. Because pulse oximetry relies on the pulse and resting state of blood flow, then it's important the tissue you're testing has a good perfusion. Very often, people will put pulse oximeters on their hands when they're really cold and will get a much reduced reading. And that's just because of something called vasoconstriction. When we get cold, blood flow to our peripheries is reduced to help maintain our core temperature. So because of the reduced blood flow to the peripheries, we'll get an inaccurate saturation reading because there's not as much of a pulse getting to the peripheries. In these circumstances, in hospitals, we use specialized probes for the forehead and ear 
because these areas are far less affected by the effects of vasoconstriction. We're starting to see a wider use of pulse oximeters in consumer wearable tech as well, a prime example being Apple's new iWatch. Now, outside of COVID-19, where I think the benefit is very clear, I'm not really sure how useful it is integrating things like saturation monitors into wearable tech. Now, absolutely, it's something we use very commonly in hospitals to track the deterioration of our patients, and it can be a very important metric in that. But if someone doesn't know how to appropriately record a reading, as well as the confounding factors as to why you might get a lower reading, then it might cause more problems than it solves by increasing health anxiety within the general public. However, I don't think that's going to change, and I think over time we're just going to see more and more health metrics measured in wearable tech, especially with an increase in general health consciousness within the public. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, okay? Being health conscious is a good thing. But when that stems into health anxiety, then we start to create a bit of a problem for ourselves. We'll need technologists and healthcare professionals to work closely together to figure out what is the right balance and what is appropriate to actually measure outside of a hospital setting and what isn't. Thanks for watching the video, guys. I'd be really interested to know what your thoughts are on saturation monitoring and wearable tech, so remember to leave a comment below. And if you got value from this video, consider pressing the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. And as always, happy devin, guys, and I'll see you in the next video.